Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back for another fabulous virtual tasting with us here at Becker Vineyards. My name is Kaylin Hall, and tonight we'll be tasting our 2016 Sanye Rosé. I hope that you've all poured yourself a very healthy glass of this tonight. Um, this is a wine that we found a couple of cases of down in our library cellar and decided to bring them out to share with all of you. Um, tonight, we have got our winemaker, John Leahy. We've got our assistant winemaker and enologist, Rachel Fanning, and our general manager, Brett Panu, will be on in a bit. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on over to them. I hope you guys all enjoy. Cheers. Cheers, Kaylin. Thanks for that great introduction. I was about to say, hey, uh, Rebecca, you changed your hair. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that great introduction. Well, I, uh, I guess, Rachel, since it's uh, up to you and I, um, and we don't have either of the doctors Beckers to uh, to give us an intro. Uh, I think we'll make Brett do the introduction. How, what do you think? <laughs> I have to say the bosses let us go. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> That's <the> way. <laughs> so Brett, would you like to introduce things for the evening, sir? Well, I think that um, like like the Beckers always do, we want to say thank you to all the first responders that are out there taking good care of us, and all the people that are hard at work bringing the uh, things that we need. Uh, to get through our days and and i and i think that you know the glass of wine that we have is our little uh uh touch of that and that's that's about all that we can offer and then uh you know john's jokes get us a long way most days too so <laughs> most days you know I mean? <laughs> not every day yeah. <laughs> okay. well you know guys we uh so the three of us were just up in uh, mason county we were over at uh, drew's uh, vineyard looking at this year's harvest, and if I'm not mistaken, I think we have a few varietals of Drews in this uh, in this particular Sanye. So um, <laughs> I, uh, without going into great detail, because I don't think I think the largest percentage of any one given varietal in here is something like eight or nine percent. So it it really is a a full blend of of different varietals, different Sanyes. So um, just to explain the term Sanye, in case you're not familiar. It, uh, it literally means to bleed. And so what we do as part of the red wine making uh, projects, I will bleed off a certain portion of that fresh juice. The hour that those grapes go into tank, we start taking a little bit of juice off of there. It does a couple of things, but uh, predominantly increases the skin to juice ratio, which makes for a slightly richer wine. It's a very natural way of increasing that, that richness and that uh, concentration on the wine. And so Rachel uh, needs to explain the story behind the 2016 Sanye. We were collecting all the Sanye into one tank, not quite sure knowing what we were gonna do with it until Rachel came into the lab one day and Rachel. <laughs> I said, it's fermenting. We have to do something now. You said, I'm not, I'm not yet, not yet, it's fine. So we just feed it and we just keep adding to it. And we just kept adding. And um, I think I mentioned this last time we, it was one of the Jolies that we were tasting and how it's a, um, it's a really ferment, funny fermentation in that it, it's my job to taste, right? Taste these fermentations, everything we have in house during harvest every single day. And this has to be hands down my least favorite fermentation because it tastes like Robitussin. So it's really, really nice at the end of fermentation when it just opens up and it's like, ah, becomes this beautiful wine and not Robitussin, it's a very cool thing. Well, and the other half of that, and I'm kind of sorry Doc isn't here, but Brett, you're going to have to tell the story about how we were going through the, the winery. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think that first of all, I want to talk about the how we found this 2016 Sanye and it's and in, in, in the notes, it's a library release. But, you know, invariably what happens is we're changing through vintages and things happen. And I, I just remember, I'm, I'm pretty sure that this is one of the ones and I was asking Bobby uh, here at Main Street exactly how this got switched out from the from the 16 to the 17. I'm pretty sure that Dr. Becker came into the winery one weekend and said, why are we not on the new rosé, the Sanye? And I said, well, we still have a little bit of the other left. He goes, I don't care. Just move the other one, get it out of here. And we thought that there might have been five or six cases left before that happened. And, and when we pulled it all back out of the tasting rooms, there was about 20 cases and we kind of shuffled it back to the warehouse. And I just kind of thought, I wonder what we're ever going to do with this, you know, with this, in this you know, Rachel, how many cases are in that warehouse right now? There's like a hundred, you know, like a hundred thousand cases of wine back there. So 20,000 cases or 20 cases sitting in there. So as we're looking for this virtual tasting stuff, I was like, is that the 16 Sanye? That was the first year that we made this. Um, I wonder, I wonder how it tastes. And so in that first year that we did this, I remember that you guys were kind of separating these batches out as the lots came in and putting the flavor components in, in the different tanks. And 
I do remember that Doc uh, came in on the weekend and he was looking for one of the rosés that he wanted to taste. And he just came in and I think he said, Tank 35 is the most incredible rosé that I've ever tasted. And, and he thought it was the Grenache Provençal. And, yep. and I said, well, Doc, unfortunately, that's not the Grenache Provençal. That's the one that Rachel and John kicked off fermentation on. And that's not what it was supposed to be, you know. And he goes, well, we got to make that one. And, and you guys, I think you told him, like, we're Signe in all these lots. And and they said that's the name and that's how Signe came to be. So yeah, it was it was really funny because we were sitting out there and he's like, "You got to taste this." And I was like, uh, "Okay," <laughs> we just tasted it. But yeah, it it was fun and and it it was meant to be a fun wine. You know, it, it the sometimes you can't can't get too serious about things. But I remember uh, going back to Rachel after she came in that next week and I said, "So we're gonna bottle the Signe." And she's like, would you just stop with the crap? And <laughs> I was like, mm. <laughs> nope, we're bottling it. <laughs> that's exactly how it happened. I mean, it went, and, and again, I think that that's one of the things that makes uh, Becker fun. Uh, the yeah. fact that, that, that we kind of let the, let the wine make itself and then, and then kind of figure out what to do with it to, the, to a certain extent. I know that sounds kind of off the cuff, but we have an idea what we're doing when we buy the grapes and we're, we're doing certain things, but there's yeah. been there's been dozens of occasions where the wine presents itself in a way that's pleasing to us. And, and, you know, that's how the Roussan I think came to be, uh, out of the, out of that lineup. And there's been 10 other wines I think that we made just, just kind of in the same story. Yeah, there, there have been. And I, I, you know, the, the thing about this, and I want to dive into the wine now that, uh, people are here and I, I want to make sure that we give a sniff and a taste to, but Rachel, um, one of the things that when we're making rosé, we certainly don't think about making rosé to last four or five years. We think it's going to be consumed within the first couple of years. So um, I want you to lead off the, the sniff uh, and the taste. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, isn't it that's so true that we don't expect the rosés to age. And, um, and I don't even think that we bottled just a whole lot of it, maybe a thousand cases, just under a thousand cases. Yeah, yeah, so not a lot. We expected it to, you know, move along down the road and find other homes. Um, how impressive though, that it's held up so well, right? Like to me, it does not, it's not showing its age. It's, um, it's got, I'm not really sure what the floral note is that I'm smelling, but as always, it's got those nice like candied watermelon, candied cherries kind of aromas, um, little honeydew, I get the melons. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I, the candied fruit, definitely. I get the floral note for me is very, very, very faint uh, gardenia. Yeah. On there, super perfumey. Well, and I actually put mine in a, normally we drink this out of a big wine glass and I have mine in the smaller bowl, if you could tell. Um, almost like the new, their new style, um, uh, I think it, their new style champagne, but it's probably a recent glass. Yeah. And I, and I kind of, I was tasting this earlier in the bigger glass and I don't think the fruit is like gone at all. I, I, and I was telling you guys that were here, they said, what do you think you're picking up on this? And I was, it's amazing to me how, when we started with this, when it was first bottled, it had kind of the brighter red fruits. And, and to me, it's more melon uh, right now. Uh, that's what I'm picking up. And you can also tell that I'm stuffed up from probably being at Drew's house uh, in the dust uh, this, this afternoon, but I, 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 I'm very, very surprised that the florals haven't disappeared in this. Usually an older rosé, even if the fruit is still there, the florals are very muted and even the meniscus starts browning. And if you hold this up against a, a white sheet of paper, and I don't know if I can do this on the camera or not, but um, you can see that it, it is not really browning at all. Um, the, it's almost like the, it's almost like the color of a really fresh watermelon. When I, I mean, to me, it's still bright. There's no browning at all. At all. No, and on the meniscus, it, it goes clear into the into the deeper rose. Now, this is slightly deeper rose color than we would, you know, than you would normally think of as a rose wine. It's not the traditional salmon color, um, but it also it's getting too for making too dark, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But but it it really it really. Um, I think some of those tannins that, that we extracted with those red wines, especially some of the bolder varietals that are in here. You know, I, I, I know we have a lot of different varietals in here. We've got Cab, we've got Malbec, we've got Petite Syrah, we've got Syrah, Zin. It, it's a hodgepodge of many, many different things. And that all comes together beautifully. Um, but I, I think those tannins have really helped preserve it. And I th I'm trying to think, um, I cannot remember. So uh, give it a taste and tell me what you guys think the alcohol is.
or rosé, it's a powerhouse. Wait, Hold on. You're talking to me. You yeah, know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, no <laughs> cheating. Oh, <that's> great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's 14.2% on the alcohol, which yeah, is extremely. It, it comes from our big red wines. Yeah. Should have, I mean, you would think, unless we alter it in some way, in which we don't, um, that it would maintain that same alcohol, right? Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being attacked under the table by a voracious mountain lion. <laughs> the damn cat just bit me while I'm sitting here. Uh, um, so it, that and I let it go. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, the I, I just I think it's it's amazing. First of all, so I just pulled up the blend sheet. I don't know if you if y'all were looking at it, but um, have it. 34% Merlot, okay. 18, 18, Temper, 18 Tempranillo, 17 Cab, 15 Dolcetto, 8% Petite Syrah, and 8% Syrah. And so, okay. and there's about, I don't know, six, no, there's eight different vineyard lots in here. And, and again, going back to that, I think that one of the things that happens is when we start talking about that, people are like, how come you don't figure out like, what you want to do or what this is going to be? And the kind of the purpose of this is more of a flavor component rather than a one variety. And I think that you guys are like doing a crazy good job of taking the, the flavors that are coming in these different lots when they come in as a red grape and trying to figure out what they're going to be when they grow up and they put it into one tank so that they can, um, you know, have that, that flavor profile, not so much the, the type of wine that, you know, the exact type of wine. John is having technical difficulties. <laughs> cat issues. John's having cat issues is what John is having. <laughs> well, I get settled. I will take that, that talk, Brett, and say that that's actually been a fun thing since we've been making the Jolie and the Seigne, um, and of course the Provençal to have these three different rosés and find three different avenues for them. And over the last several years being able to, and it, this is all in the midst of a hot and heavy harvest, things are coming in, we're making decisions just as quickly as we can to be able to pull aside the, the different saignets from the different red grapes um, and try to make sure that they stay together so that we can try to put a flavor profile together, right? And, you know, we kind of locally call the saignet the Jolie's little sister, came out a couple of years later. And typically the saignet is not as big of a rosé as the Jolie has been. Um, it's kind of in that middle of the road between the Provençal and the um, and Jolie. So trying to keep that together during harvest, trying to make sure that the um, that we keep those flavor profiles in check. It, it's fun, isn't it, John? Yeah, <laughs> fun's a good way of putting it. So there was a question, um, and no, I'm going to ignore all the cat questions. And yes, you're right, the cat won. Somebody just wrote that on Facebook. Looks like the cat won. Um, the, the question was, at what point in time do we, we take the juice off? Um, the, and, and that point is within the, the same day that we harvest that we crush into tank is when we take. Uh, sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes we'll take it up to 24 hours later, depending on a few other factors in the tank. But most of the time, the sanye is coming off the first day. So that, you know, remember these grapes, some of these grapes have been in skin contact for eight to 10 hours prior to getting crushed into tank. Some of the stuff's coming from the high plains, some of it's coming from the hill country. So uh, certainly the stuff that comes from the estate is, um, uh, you know, taken off right away. Stuff that comes from the high plains, you know, eight to 10 hours later. And, yeah. and, talk, and talk a little bit, talk a little bit about how you determine whether to take 1% or 10% off on that senye for the, like, if it's Cabernet coming in, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. makes the, what makes the differentiation between a percent and 10? Cause 10 makes me cringe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 10, 10 does, uh, especially so we never tell Brett when we actually take 15 out of there. Um, so, but um, the one of the deciding factors on, on the percentage is the um, one, we look at the damage to the fruit. If there's, if there's no fruit damage, um, then we're likely to take more. Um, if there's too much fruit damage, um, you know, we have to mitigate other things, but um, like bird damage, things like that. The other thing we look at is the pinking on the berry skins. How ripe is the fruit? Is the fruit slightly underripe, overripe? You know, at what at grade scale that we visually look at each bin, what do I think? And if I see a lot of pink and larger berries, then I'm unlikely to take more juice to increase that skin to juice ratio. Um, if I, I see almost near perfect fruit, I sometimes we don't send yay, but if we're at that near perfect stage, we'll just send you a small percent just to give it a little oomph in there. 
that's the, the basic. And we'd still do direct press for rosé as well. We don't just make the rosés from Sanye. Um, we also do direct press, which is always a wonderful, you know, um, discussion that we have every fall. Uh, I'm like, oh, I'd love to direct press this. And Brett's like, do you know how much we pay for those grapes? And I'm like, yeah, look, they're going in the press. Uh, so, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but we, I, we don't, um, the, the, the point for the Sanye is not just the rosé. The point for the Sanye is actually um, to make better red wine. So that decision is, is based on what's going to be good for that lot. Well, I think one of the things that we always do too is like when we come up with a new wine like this, we blind, I mean, we taste it against the ones we already have. And if anybody lined up the Provencal and the Sagne and the Jolie, nobody, I don't think anybody would think that they're a similar wine. They're all very different. And stylistically, we're doing that on purpose. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that uh, next week when we do the three rosés in our tasting. I think if you, if you do all three of the Jolies, uh, next week, you're going to find a big shift in the new vintage of it. And that's something that we've kind of kept under our hats for this year. And I'm not going to divulge it yet. Uh, it's it's one of our little secrets, but uh, there's going to be a little bit of a stylistic change, maybe in some of these wines slightly. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so somebody just asked, what is direct press? Okay, Rachel, it's a very complex question. And I think we need the enologist to answer that. I can do this. I can handle the science stuff. Um, so that's literally the grapes come in and we, red grapes, white grapes, they come in, they immediately go into a press and we press them and it goes into tank. And then but we correct together. If we want, if I want to, we can do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, we can. We can. <laughs> Typically. <laughs> um, the, uh, so whenever we're doing that with a red, typically it's going to be like the Grenache. Um, since so we've done that with, uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Grenache is a big one. Um, we'll direct press that, meaning again, red grapes go straight into the press and we drain that juice off. We press the juice out, put that in the tank and ferment it like it's a white wine. Right. Um, as opposed to fermenting the whole grape as we would for a red wine. Um, and somebody just asked, John, is there a, a bias to north to south uh, bias on ripening? And I'm assuming you mean Northern High Plains versus, versus uh, Hill Country? Um, well, we're in the middle of hill country harvest now. We have not yet started the high plains, though that might start this week, this next week. Um, so yes, the, we slightly earlier start. Now, if you're, you're talking about row bias, it depends on the layout of the row, whether <laughs> it's a north to south bias. But um, yeah, so the, the direct press is actually a technique for the, for the rosé. And there are people out there who think the only way to make rosé is direct press, the traditional method. And um, you know, I, I now I feel like I need to break into song, like doing the song from Fiddler on the Roof. Is it, anybody up for a musical? I think you're going to have to now. <laughs> Fred, yeah, look at Fred. My <laughs> vote's no. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think we talked about this on the drive back from, from Mason today about the fact that we're going to be picking the Chardonnay at Drew Talents Vineyard in, in Mason, Texas. And then the Canada Vineyard, probably Chardonnay at the end of the week or like very close to it. And normally they're a, a three or four week apart. Right. And so the north to south ripening is like you said a twofold question. Whoever asked that needs to clarify their 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 answer or their, their question because yeah. there yeah. is a huge there is a huge difference in both. Um, and north to south row, row orientation, you have the most radical uh, light exposure with the you know sun coming up and the sun setting. And so a lot of times growers will shade their canopy more on the on the west side mm -hmm. for that. But if you're going east to west. You really don't have that shading other than where the sun is setting in, in, in our season. It could be, you know, higher on one side in, in, the, in the spring and then, and then and it moves kind of off to the other side in the fall a little bit. So there, there's a huge there's a huge question about that when you're putting your vineyard in. Yeah. So apparently it's like this big globe keeps tilting and turning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but when you said sunrise and set, it just reminded me yet another song from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Uh, so in case you're curious, that's Brett's smile that, oh, wait till we get off of this broadcast, buddy. <laughs> like Rachel needs to take over. <laughs> well, Rachel, uh, well, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to sing it. Hey, I'm this, is, this is what happens when you sit in the car all day together. I mean, this is like, you know, all three of us have been together since like, what, 10 o'clock this morning or something, like stuck in my truck, so. Right. <laughs> Whoa, seasons, exactly. That's a good word. Maybe we should use that word. Somebody said you could call it seasons. 
<laughs> you know, when the sun moves in the, you know. Yeah. We have it, but it's in Italian. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Look, it's Italian. laughs> okay, so uh, Rachel, um, now that you've had a few sips of that wine, what do you think about food pairings? What would you do? I, off the top of my head, Thai food. I would like like a red curry. I think it would be so yum. Green curry would make me happy too. Mm -hmm. But Thai food in general. Thai food in general for that sounds lovely. Brett, don't say um, it. Don't say it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what's crazy is uh, we stopped at that little cafe in Mesa today and had that and had that pork chop and and kind of that 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 uh, sautéed uh, uh, green bell peppers and onions and. And, and squash and, and I, I would have totally dug this with with that pork chop and you know it was like a home homemade you know and I'm trying not to eat the bread roll thing and I ate the middle of it out but I, I think that this 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 wine and our rosés go so well with almost anything that's lighter uh, for the summertime and, and I would I would go with that all day yeah um, and people are agreeing with both of you here um, somebody just mentioned empanadas which sounds really good to me uh, I'm actually, even though it's still August and it's still hotter than anything outside on certain days, I'm starting to think roast fowl with this. I, I honestly think either goose or pheasant and I'm going to have, so at the end of September, you got the first day you can actually have roasted goose is the 29th of September. That's Michael Moss. So that's, um, that, that means if you have roasted goose on that day, you will want for nothing for the rest of the year. So everybody get out their roasting pans. <laughs> but yeah, I think roasted fowl with this would be awesome. Hence why we suggest rosés also for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you know, it, it, it does do very well. And I'm thinking like, you know, dove, you know, yeah. the, the bacon wrap dove would be incredible with this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, but you, were, you were mentioning that pork chop. I mean, this would go equally well with a nice, uh, you know, roast, you know, pork roast. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I keep thinking is like the pork chop with the, um, like the apple chutney on it. Oh, yeah. good call, Rachel. Absolutely. That would be awesome. But it is, it's also just a wonderful wine, just a porch wine too. I mean, it really is a nice sunset wine, um, I think. You know, we did not use any, really any barrel aging on this. This was all stainless. Um, so it, it was a, a one pot wonder, so to speak. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, roasted quail, somebody asks. Absolutely roasted quail. So there was a clarification to the orientation question earlier. They were thinking regional orientation. So um, Brett, under non-2020 conditions, what do you notice between uh, Hill Country and High Plains usually on? Well, historically, if you're going by variety on the same rootstock and in a similar, I mean, so here's here's why our questions that we usually answer is the answer is it depends. Mm -hmm. It's because it does depend on the crop load. It depends on the wheat, all this stuff. And so what we're seeing right now is that high plains fruit that may have been reduced in yield that should have not been maybe ready three weeks from now, all of a sudden is ready because the canopy grew, the yield has been reduced and the fruit is ripening at a, diff at a different curve. But in a normal year, if we're picking, you know, Chardonnay in, in the hill country, we should be picking Chardonnay in the high plains until about two to three weeks later. And that curve goes with every variety as you go down the list. So if right. you go to Tempranillo, it's usually different, but what we're seeing this year is, man, I don't know. Like I, if you, if you, gave me a million bucks to make a, you know, a throw a dart. I might be able to hit the wall kind of, um, but the bottom line is, is historically, and, and you got to think about it in, in terms of if you don't grow grapes and you grow vegetables, they can't put their gardens in as it goes North, you know, until weeks later. So their, their crop doesn't get riper. And, and I mean, think about it in that simple term, but the reason why our harvest is spread out so, so long is because we are in a seven hour difference with our growers in the high plains, uh, you know, and, and and north to south ratio, and it just doesn't get ripe that fast. And, and that's also the reason why we do it, because, you know, if a freeze hits uh, us down here, our grapes have, you know, have sprouted out and they're coming out the cordon and they're still dormant in Lubbock. Uh, the freeze could roll down and wipe us out, but they haven't even started, you know, greening up yet. And vice versa, we could be way far along and the freeze doesn't hit us down here, but it hits them. And so a lot of this is, is kind of tactical. Uh, there is a reason why we do what we do and spread that risk out so that we can have a crop every year. Uh, there was clarification to the September 29 question. It's roasted goose on the 29th of September, not duck. Duck, you can have any time. <laughs> <So. laughs> How many rules? 
I, yeah, there are, aren't there? I do want to add a little bit more to what Brett was saying about the how things ripen and how they come in. And there's kind of, like you said, it depends. There's all these other factors come into it. But kind of generally speaking, the lighter bodied grapes tend to ripen earlier, mm -hmm. thus they're harvested earlier. And um, so we start with the whites. Mm -hmm. Vignettes are usually very, very early on. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, is, it's our first one, it kicks off our harvest every year. So those lighter whites, and then we kind of trickle into lighter reds and then go down the, you know, to our bigger reds. Um, it seems like, again, generally speaking, that the whites from the high plains will come in just about the time that we're finishing up reds from the hill country. Just kind of ish, generally, right. yeah. There's a little overlap, but you know, it also depends too um, on the, the amount that the vines are holding. You know, are they heavily, heavy, are they light? Um, the age of the vine, you know, the younger vines that tend to be more vigorous can often produce sugar a little quicker. And then we have to play catch up with the phenolic ripeness on there. So, um, and I, I think we're seeing a little bit of that this year too. As Brett pointed out earlier um, in discussions at the winery, you know, it's like, well, some of these are holding a third of what they normally do. They're gonna ripe it a little quicker because they're holding a good canopy, but they're not holding as much fruit, so. Which also, I mean, it, it also tends to lend itself to the fact that when we say don't overcrop your, your canopy so we can have ripe fruit, you know, but that's the balance of trying to grow grapes and production for, you know, to make tonnage, but also trying to grow very high quality. And, right. and again, almost every single one of our growers understands that they can't put, you know, 10 tons per acre on a vine that can only hold four and right. get it to its most perfect ripeness. But as the winer, we also try not to say, well, you can only put four if we can make a gold medal wine if you put six. And it, mm -hmm. and it, and it doesn't jeopardize the vine for that one particular year that you're growing six tons per acre on it, that you're, you can consistently do that and not hurt anything. And I think that that is kind of the balance of, of between vineyard and winery and you know, all that, all that fun. Really, really good questions here. The first one, and I'm, I'm going to do both of them right away here. But the first one is, do the, those ripening issues from north to south, do they, do they create real problems for the winery every year between varietals? Is it a real problem for us to deal with? And I, my personal short answer is no, it's not a real problem. It is a, an issue we have to pay attention. That is part of harvest. You know, it's every year it's that. So we, you know, Brett has charted out every harvest and every varietal from each vineyard and what day we've picked it on the last several years. So we've got this nice, beautiful arc showing, you know, what we can expect roughly. And from there, then we, we've got, it's a problem of logistics, which is also Brett's uh, Ballywick um, on there. The one problem that we run into is when things are coming in, everything is coming in so fast that just finding a home for it, finding a tank, finding barrels for it, we have them, but we're using them. You know, mm -hmm. everything is very busy. So there's right. no problem. I mean, this is this is our job. This is what we do. Right. Yeah, is that the problem is harvest. Um, and the reason they call it harvest is because all of the great four letter cuss words were taken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other question was, uh, how long does a vine produce fruit? So uh, that that varies on varietal. That also varies on region of country. Um, Brett, there's vines, there's vines in Europe that are they, they're a thousand years old that have been producing fruit, correct? Yeah, uh, close. There, are se there are several examples of, of a couple hundred years and a few hundred yeah. years. Um, yeah, but but historically, you know, old vine is if you read old vine on a label, that means it's more than 50 years old. That's what it's required, I believe, by TTB to call it old vine on the front of the wine label. Uh, commercial viability is something that you could get into all day long and Commercially viable vines might mean one thing for one person, another for another, but historically what I think you're going to see is, I don't know, 20 to 30 years is kind of the max where it's really, really producing the, the amount of tonnage that it needs. And then it may start falling off in the tonnage, but the quality might still be there. And so every producer has to kind of make up their mind about where does that line get drawn, where I was making five tons an acre and now I'm only making two and a half. Do I pull it out and start over to make my five tons on a new growth? And, and that's something that you, you know, I think after the movie Sideways uh, in, in, in California, they were pulling out Merlot like crazy to put in Pinot Noir, and that had nothing to do with, you know, the fact that the vines weren't producing. Nope. Uh, I, but there's also a little thing called depreciation on our taxes that in, in 30 years, you can't depreciate your vines anymore. So it actually saves you a ton of money on a half a million dollar acre vineyard uh, to replant it so you can start your depreciation over. Right. So the next, the next question I have is, what is it that makes the wine hold up so well in bottle? And I guess because I've personally touched every grape. So, but 
I think, no, no, there's another answer to that, Rachel. Are you sure? I thought it was me. It's the voodoo. It's the voodoo we do. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so funny because you ask five people in the water what makes that taste so good. That's like, well, I put my finger in it like this, right? Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> 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 Just like this, like a big cocktail. <laughs> no, um, well, one is the way we treat the wine during pre, post fermentation winemaking, how we preserve that wine uh, simply in an oxygen free environment that goes a long way. And temperature is your best friend in the winery for preservation. Lower the temperature for long term storage, the more even keeled that wine is, the better preserved it is, the less likely to have um, other bacterial issues in it. Um, or oxidation issues. I have a thought, a little yeah. question that just dawned on me. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, we typically don't have rosés that we sell for four years and get to release them as a library release. That's just not something that I don't think most It's a bad habit I have. A bad habit? Yeah, I'm making wine for wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that maybe this actually gets a lot of benefit from those tannins mm -hmm. of being a red wine, you know, the red grapes and, and how we, and the acidity? Because those are the things that we attribute to red wines. Yeah, Thank that's you. what I was talking about earlier. You know, that some of the, we get a little more oomph from those red grapes from sitting on skins for a little bit. So yeah, it, you know, it is, it is a. I mean, the Sanya is a bastardization of rosé. You know, traditional rosé making. I, I, you know, it, it's not. I'm not poo pooing the traditional method at all. I actually kind of, in my heart and soul, am a bit of a traditionalist on that respect. Um, but I do, you're absolutely right, Rachel, it is the tannins, it is the, the phenolic structure in there that, that helps preserve this wine. It's also the alcohol. I mean, alcohol and winemaking is not our goal. As a winemaker, it's not my goal to make alcohol. My goal is to make a wine that is balanced and, uh, and, and tastes good, tastes varietally correct, and goes on. Alcohol acts as at one of the three major things. It acts as a preservative. Um, you know, so there's that to take into consideration. The fact that we take care of our wines and the fact that I have an enologist who is a, a bit of an extraordinarily regimented individual when it comes to, to doing the chemistry and making sure that we're, we're, I give her a target. And if I ignore that target, I was like, what? We, we have this rule, you said. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, but we do, we do. Uh, our team at work takes care of these wines and, and that's the, the, a very important part of it. Um, do you have continuously replant new vines in the Becker vineyards? Uh, well, Brett, do we have to continuously replant new vines in the Becker vineyards? I'd like to point out the vine that is behind Brett. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Talk about one of those Becker vines. <laughs> that, vine, that vine behind me, and Doc is going to give us a hard time because it looks like it's coming out of my head, but right. um, is, a, is like a 35-year-old uh, Sauvignon Blanc vine that came out of the Ballinger vineyard that uh, we sold a couple of years ago, but uh, we have quite a few of these, so if anybody wants one, you know, contact the wine club department. They're not cheap. Uh, it's kind of like a piece of art in my mind, and, and we do have some, but I think the continuation of, or continually renewing what you're doing, and I think we talked about this on the previous broadcast about the the vines or the, the plantings that worked at the winery that we pulled out because they died or whatever happened, and, and I do think it's kind of a continuous loop to a certain extent, but again, ultimately what we'd love to do is plant a vine, have it be perfect for 20 years of its life, 30 years of its life, um, decide when it drops off by 20% of its production, if we're going to do that, and that's that, that if that could happen, holy cow, right? I mean, in this state, that's not going to happen. There's not a normal. Uh, we're trying to figure out what that is, and I think that what we have learned is that nothing is normal, and we just have to kind of deal with it. And we're still making great wines, and I think winers across the state are doing it. But uh, the renewal part is something that you have to be like. I have a different opinion than maybe what John would have, or that Rachel would have, or the Dr. Becker would have, and I think you'll see that across pretty much every winery, you know, or, or wine grower in the state. Uh, some of our vineyards in Lubbock that have had great successes, maybe they they lose, you know, like in this year they lost 60% of their crop and that's the year that they go back in and renew. And it may not be that they're replanting completely, they might be cutting off uh, to the ground and retraining new arms. It might be that they're coming above the cordon and putting new arms. So it's not like this ultimate, like you gotta, you know, it, there's there's a lot of variation in that renewal. It doesn't just mean planting new vines. It means if it means renewing old vines that you have, because you got to realize the root system's in the ground, and if the root system's healthy, that those things will kick out and grow like crazy. But sometimes that can be bad too, because you have so much bigger that you're trying to control it, and, and that's 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 a definite problem. Yeah. So we have, um, you know, the the one follow up to that, Brett, is what's not cheap when you're talking about the vine art. <laughs> People want to know what the price is. 
Oh, um, I think this one, if I could find one, would be about seventeen hundred dollars somewhere in there. So yeah. Fifteen to seventeen hundred for that bigger one. We've got we've got them for sale uh, normally on the front steps of the tasting room uh, on the wine club block, and and we've been trying to kind of get them out when we we preserved a bunch of these. I think I've got a few of them. Um, but that, that's what they are. But if you're interested in one, they're all different. So it's not like you could take a picture of it, and put it on Etsy or, you know, Pinterest. And it's like, here's your standard vine. It's, uh, that, that's about what they run, but we've got them. I think we've got them anywhere from 1700 all the way down to 300, but the $300 ones are pretty spindly. Okay. You know, so, but they're still somebody cool. just asked what did the vine behind Brett die from. And the answer is Brett. <laughs> 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 a little chapter blight. No, yeah, yeah, right. You see how you see how happy it was on the on the arms before. I mean, it's still it was still growing when I ripped it from the ground. You know, <laughs> no, we we sold we sold that vineyard and the people weren't going to do anything with it. Those 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 vines were in there and we, we we went in and got the big ones out, and and they took the little ones and bulldozed them in and, and I just thought it was it was it was awful to to get rid of all that. Right. And, we, it, and and it's also something too that probably you know the people and I was joking about Pinterest and Etsy, but you know looking at that stuff. Uh, it, it's crazy what people do with a, a, a arm of a grapevine and turn it into a lantern and it's a $1,500 lantern. So that was kind of the thought. Well, um, we got <laughs> somebody counter offered for $17. <laughs> I wouldn't even take the, you know, the, the one screw out of the side of it for 17 bucks. <laughs> okay. So, um, again, remind us next week, they order the, the order of the Jolies that we'll be tasting in next week's roundup. Are you asking me? No. <laughs> what? What? This one I can do right this time. Yeah. 17, 18, and 19. Okay, and Monday, 17 Thursday, Friday. and 19 are both new releases. We actually bottled these very closely together yeah. and um, going to release them, at least for this tasting at the same time. Yeah, so they're not, they've not officially been released, but we're going to, I mean, normally we wait and have an official release, but since we bottled both of those, we're going to go ahead and release them for the tasting. And then I don't know if we're going to, wait till the 17 has gone before he lets it kind of back out into the world or if we're just going to have three really cool jellies that are out there. Um, and then, and then the remainder of this week on, on Wednesday, we've got the, uh, Carignan. Carignan, which is a new release of a brand new wine that we've ever made. And then the culinaria 16 on Friday, which was on the same palette as this that I found, uh, in, in the stash at the back and it just kind of fell together and it worked really neat that we had this, a uh, little bit of culinaria. And I think that the 16 is the one that I drank, uh, a, quite a bit of as far as it's just a great blend and and it was food friendly so that one should be good for friday perfect well i promised everybody an update to harvest um last week so today we actually harvested our front block of malbec um so that that's right at the front vineyard you can't really see it from the road it's right behind the petite sirah and the and the sirah back in the far corner we took that today we got um you know five and a quarter tons of wonderful malbec fruit off of that this morning, got it in tank. So um, our red harvest has started and on its way. And, and tomorrow we'll learn about what the next varietals coming off this week will be. So uh, um, harvest is going, mm -hmm. whether we want it to or not, I guess it's here, Rachel. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, make, make plenty of food and put it in the freezer. Um, so any, any, final, any final words, Rachel, before we sign off for the evening? No, you know, I just want to say how much I appreciate that we talk about this, that the, the viewers who keep coming back, it's like having friends and we talk about you guys. Um, so we really enjoy the fact that y'all keep coming back and you keep letting us do this. It, it's been a lot of fun. I, I, I agree. And people are asking for more harvest videos. So Brett, will we be having more harvest videos and more videos? Yes. yes. <laughs> if I can, <laughs> Kaylin is going to be on top of that with me. Uh, we're going to, I mean, I have to just remember to do it is the bad thing because we get so wrapped up in making sure that we're uh, not blowing tractor tires and, and, and getting the fruit in at certain times. But even today when we were at Drew's, I, you know, we're looking through the fruit and Kaylin told me when I left, she's like, make sure you take pictures. And, uh, and I, and I forget to do it, but we'll, we'll, def we'll definitely keep everybody updated on that. So. so somebody just asked chemistry. So I'm assuming you mean the mall back. So it came in at 3.92 pH and 23 bricks. We'll see where it soaks up from there. So, um, I just want to wish everybody a cheers and I want to add my, my second vote to, to Rachel's good words for the evening. And we do appreciate everyone. Thank you for joining us and thank you for letting us in your lives for 30 minutes. And, and thank you to everybody out there keeping us safe and healthy. So cheers, have a good night. We'll see everybody on Wednesday.